History happened everywhere. The verdict. This is our after show podcast where we look back at the most recent episode, Animal in Dominica, during 1764 to 1848. So if you haven't listened to that, go back and check it out or else you will encounter spoilers ahead. I finished that glass of rum and there is a very nasty deposit on the inside of the glass. Hello, my name is Peter Goddard, and you're here in the HAT studio with the Dolly the Sheep to my Dolly the Sheep, the wonderfully woolly Ryan Weir. Ah, nice, the clone jokes. You see, do you like that? That's one for the older generation, I think. Dolly the Sheep was quite a long time ago, but still. Yeah. Look it up, young people. Uh, and we're joined, as ever, by the deliberately dolorous Paul Dursley, the judge himself. I'm not dolorous. <laughs> I don't know what dolorous means. Oh. He might be at the end of this episode. Let's find out. <laughs> well, it's a Ryan episode, isn't it? So it's going to be, what, is it an F? Should we just get, it, should we just get to the point now? <laughs> no, it's the process that he enjoys so much. <laughs> but what's the process about? You know what? I've forgotten. So have I. Could you possibly remind us, Ryan, in the space of approximately 60 seconds? Uh, I don't know. I'm not really feeling it. I'll give you £2.50. All right, done. <laughs> Ready? Let's go. In this animalistic episode of Caribbean Wonder, we travel to the nature island of Dominica to learn about the various things that lived there. We learned about the turbulent colonial years and met the group of escaped slaves who hid in the island's rainforest and conducted a guerrilla-style campaign against the plantation owners and armies of the French and the British. We uncorked a bottle of Dominican rum and sampled some of my home-brewed bush rum, which I'd infused with the corpses of locusts, crickets, and worms. And we covered some of the island's other edible creatures, including the agouti and the crapo, a now endangered frog which, during our time period, made up the key ingredient in a delicious dish called Mountain Chicken. That was last week's episode done. Summarised nicely, nice one, son. Now we're over to a young Dursley who's gonna tell you what he thought of thee. He'll take you apart without any care. He's the lovely Paul Dursley. The lovely Paul Dursley. What's this definition of we? We, me and Pete. Yes, I thought you said we we sampled some ah. <laughs> <laughs> did, I, did we sampled you? the rum. I think you can be one person or two, but we <laughs> is definitely more than one. Yeah, okay. So when when I say we sampled, it's the royal we. I definitely sampled. You definitely did. And you definitely... Did not. ...backed out when it was pointed <laughs> out. I think the judge makes an excellent point here. Hey, I needed to record the episode. I needed my throat to be clear of <laughs> locust wings and <laughs> mealworm grubs. But now, it's more of a chat. It's not a focused episode. That's very true. You could probably have right, some delicious rum now. Let's do it. Oh, no, I haven't got any left. I sent some to young Dursley. You have some in front of you, isn't that right? Yes, I have a rather disgusting looking cocktail. <laughs> With locust in it. I have to say, it is well worth visiting hatepodcast.com to see the picture of this cocktail. It is a, a work of art. I'm, I'm quite impressed, I must say. <laughs> it, it does look, a, at first glance, it does look like a bit of a turd floating in urine. <laughs> Now you mention it. Well, enjoy drinking that. Because uh, it previously was appetising in concept, but now you've really spoiled it. Your locust... Uh, is it? Which one do you have, actually? That's worth asking. Well, the locust one. Actually, I'm, I'm, ju I'm just going to have a locust now. I've, I've, I've actually been sipping on it for the last 10 minutes. Oh, right. Nice. And how is it? The locust's a bit chewy. It's a bit nothingy. Yeah, I found it kind of like a little bit of wet paper, really. It was, that sounds appetising. <laughs> it didn't taste of anything. It's just, it was just all texture, and it was a sort of squashy... Yeah, but texture is so important. Yeah, well, I was worried it would be crunchy. Oh, really? I yeah. think crunchy would have been better. Oh, I like a good crunch. Maybe you just need to get your cricket in. Oh, then there's an infuse in the rum. You won't have the medicinal benefits. Hmm. Well, yeah, I, mine has been infusing in the rum for days, hasn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, long, long old time. More Let me just take a sip. Let me just take a sip of the, the rum. Okay. What did we say the locust power gave? I think it was appetite. And that's one thing I don't need. <laughs> <laughs> but Ryan, you're still not drinking your insect rum, I notice. No, I've got a lovely glass of sparkling water. I'm not going to infest my body with some creature that's just going to crawl out of me later. <laughs> 
Enjoy that, guys. All right. Well, just remember, it's my episode next week. Yeah, that's fine. Well, if you put cowardice in as a score, you're likely to score very high. <laughs> yeah, let's see, let's finally. See what the categories are. Maybe they'd include cowardice. I don't know. <laughs> but Dominica wise, have you ever been to Dominica? Um, no, I haven't. Uh, I did at least know it was a separate country to the Dominican Republic. Ah, uh, good. Yeah. Uh, how much did you do before you realised? I did have to double check for sure. Well, there are a lot of confusing islands in that area, so mm-hmm. it's true. I want to talk about Lord Rollo. Lord Rollo. Because you said, I don't know anything about him, but he sounds like a terrible person. I, that was my assumption. Yeah, I know. And and it was a right assumption to make. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought maybe I could give you some background to Lord Rollo. Uh, so Lord Rollo of <laughs> Duncrub in the county of Perth isn't a person. It's a title that, that many people have had. Ah. So it was confusing when I did my research because there are many Lord Rollos. So it comes from the Norwegian Hrolf, which was a Viking chief in the sort of 9th century. Probably worth pointing out that we're talking about Perth in Scotland rather than Perth, Australia. I didn't realise the Vikings got to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a really good point. So this is from the Norwegian Hrolf. Uh, it's a Viking chief who was known as Rollo the Walker because he was so big that no horse could carry him. <laughs> <laughs> There used to be a children's television programme called King Rollo. There was a children's television programme called King Rollo. The first Lord Rollo was created in 1651 for Sir Andrew Rollo, after which came James, then Andrew, then Robert, and then Andrew. (laughs) So there's lots of Andrews in the Rollo line. Andrew Rollo, the fifth Lord of Rollo, is the Rollo that we're talking about. Right. So, born 1703, he was the son of Robert Rollo and Mary Roll. Ah. Right. Daughter. They didn't choose to double barrel to Roll Rollo then. <laughs> <laughs> Daughter of Sir Henry Rollo of Woodside. Ah. Different Rollos. Uh, sounds a bit incestuous. It does a little bit, doesn't that it? That would be amazing. What's your name? Andrew Rollo Rollo. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I could tell you there there is a, a name which is something like Tolimash Tolimash de Plantagenet Tolimash Tolimash, which is uh, some noble, nubile surname in England. Tolimash That's the surname. Tolimash Tolimash de Plantagenet Tolimash Tolimash. It sounds like you've just cast a spell on us. Uh, So he married Catherine Murray on the 24th of April, 1727. They had their first kid, Anna, in 1729. 1743, at the age of 40, he joins the army. Age 40. Can you imagine? Oh, bloody that's oh, yeah. Old, uh... Uh, and he fights in the War of the Austrian Succession. Uh, four years later, 1750, he gets promoted to major. And by 1756, he commands the 22nd Regiment of Foot. By 1757, he's been in the army now for, what, 14 years? And he heads off to the Americas. And he sees action in New York. Cape Breton Island, Sorel, and Montreal, where he's part of the the attack on Montreal where they surrender, and with it, essentially, all of Canada. The Heights of Abraham. They name Rollo Bay in Prince Edward Island after him. In 1760, he's made Brigadier General, so he's rising in the ranks. He's in his mid-50s at this point. Exactly. Uh, And on May 3rd, 1761, he sails from New York to the West Indies, where on the 6th of June, with a force of just 2,500 men, he leads the attack on the French in Dominica. He obviously wins there within a matter of days and he's made commander in chief of Dominica. So immediately he leaves. And in 1762, he goes to Martinique and he beats the French there too. Uh, But during that battle in Martinique, he loses his only son, John. A year later, 1763, his wife dies. And in 1764, just a year later, he contracts a fever and has to return to Britain because he's Clearly not well. So that was 1764. He remarries on the 16th of February, 1765. And just four months later, in 1765, 2nd of June, he dies on his way home to Scotland, where he is now interred in a tomb there, which is sort of, you know how like they put a stone version of yourself lying on top of your tomb? Right. He has one of those. And there are a bunch of them for the whole effi- family. It's a kind of a packet of Rollos. <laughs> <laughs> an e- effigy. Yes, exactly that, an effigy. Uh, he died without his son. Um, so he's succeeded by his younger brother, who is then made the sixth Lord. It's like Doctor Who. <laughs> and as of 2017, the titles are held by the 10th 
Lord's great-great-grandson, the 14th Lord, who succeeded his father in 1997, and he is now the hereditary clan chief of Clan Rollo. Well, that was less awful than I was expecting. I was waiting for you to tell me that he slaughtered all the indigenous people everywhere he went, so... I found nothing in my in, in, in the notes, in the research, to indicate that he was a terrible, terrible person, other than he fought a lot for nearly nearly 20 years. Right, you can't okay. be a terrible, terrible person with a name like Rollo, can you? <laughs> well, it's not his name. It's his title. What's his surname? Rollo. <laughs> <laughs> he was Rollo. Lord Rollo of Rollo. That's why I'd like you to refer to me as Peter Croydon from now on. It often happens that a title is the same as the surname, but but in a lot of cases, it's not. You think like someone like the Duke of Norfolk, his surname isn't Norfolk, it's Howard or Fitzalan Howard. Peter wow. Goddard of Goddard. Yes. The Baron Goddard of Croydon <laughs> land. <laughs> There is another role based name, Geno Rollet. It's a Frenchman. Um, and I wanted to tell this story because I think it was indicative of the time. Just to be clear, the only link <laughs> is yeah, Rollet. Yes, the name Roll. Well, not the only link. But, um, <laughs> so, uh, Geno Rollet is living in Martinique and he makes an agreement with a Kalinago chief to set up a base for a small scale sort of timber production house. Uh, he writes in his notes, After about a year, I was a bit more confident with the Caribs, and I got their permission to bring my wife and my little family from Martinique, and also permission to build a home like theirs for my family. And I proposed to them that they sell me 14 or 15 carrières of land. Do you know what that is, Paul? I haven't heard of that unit of measure. It's probably an old French. Yeah. I would think carrière, acre, a lot of the letters are the same, so oh, it could are. be the same thing. Yeah, no. It's very good. The chief agrees to the request on two conditions. <laughs> he says no crucifix to be erected anywhere and no horned cattle to be imported. So he uh, agrees the sale. They certify it on a piece of paper upon which they painted bows and arrows using red dye. Uh, Rollet was a very religious man with a firm belief that he was being guided by the Holy Spirit. So... In defiance of the Calinago's wishes, he erects a stout wooden cross. <laughs> the two rules. I could see this coming. Go on. Yeah. I bet he introduces cattle as well. Well, uh, he, he erects his stout wooden cross, but it's burned down. Along with his home <laughs> and all his belongings, uh, the remains of which are then tossed into the sea. He said, The Caribs saw my cross as a victory of the Christian faith and made war on my settlement. And to save myself, I had to hide in the woods with my family and slaves. Oh, the poor guy. He just <laughs> did one of the two things he was specifically told not to do. <laughs> so, what did he do, Pete? I'm going to guess he rebuilt his house. Yeah, he and did. Built a bigger fence. No. And snuck a cross in the in the living room. He put, he put a cross outside his house. Oh, okay, so another, I didn't hide it then. He built another <laughs> giant cross. Yeah, and that was attacked too. Uh, in fact, he kept on building crosses and they kept on being attacked. <laughs> At which point you'd think his family might be saying, can we just stop with the cross? But he, every time he put it up, he, was, he, he kind of improved the cross. Uh, and he got to a point where he put this one tree trunk up <laughs> as a cross that was covered in thorns <laughs> because he thought, well, maybe they can't attack that one. Uh, he said, every time I made a new cross, I made them stronger and stronger, he boasted. I think he's learning the wrong lesson here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And as the conflict continues between between him and the Kalinago, he fortifies his plantation, he puts walls around it, he arms his slaves uh, to help defend the place. His cross was important to him, what can I say? Eventually, he says, enough, and he directs his men to go and produce a stone cross, right? They're not going to burn that down. So they chisel it from a single rock measuring seven feet and 11 ponces wide. I don't know what a ponce is either. A ponce is an inch. Oh, all right. So seven feet and 11 ponces wide. But <laughs> <laughs> How wide's a ponce? <laughs> uh, but also, because he had made it of stone, he needed to move it, so he brought some oxen. Of course, there you go. There was <laughs> a, Martin, <laughs> I have an unbreached rule here. Perhaps I can deal with that. At two <laughs> birds with one stone. So he brings some oxen from Martinique to haul the cross and places it at a low hill 200 paces from where it was made. 
<laughs> anyway, defying that second point, it angers the Kalanagos further. Surprise! <laughs> yeah. And so every now and then the Kalanagos sort of launch a, a token attack against the cross, firing arrows at his cattle. <laughs> but uh, they couldn't get it down. And so today uh, it still stands in Grand Bay, the, the, the cross. It's the oldest surviving symbol of Christianity in Dominica. And, and postscript, Jean-Marie Rollet died in 1753 at the age of 92 and was buried at the foot of his cross. I mean, that just ends... There was no, there's no penalty. There's no, the guy was a jerk and he won. Yep. <laughs> Got his cross. I like the way it starts with, I've earned their trust. Now I shall betray it all completely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's a sort of an allegory of our time, of their times. Isn't it? It's a neat little story. It sort of summarizes the position that, that people had about it at the time. If you'd have, if you'd have put that in the episode, you'd got a high, you'd have got a higher score. No. <laughs> so, Pete, what do you want to talk about? I want to talk about sperm whales. Ooh. Uh, I'm sure Paul enjoyed our little sketch. Read the whales, little pod of family pod of whales who live around Dominica and don't travel around like whales are prone to doing. Um, yes, skit. I think one of those, three of those letters are right. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's probably alluding to the lack of a clear punchline that we abandoned in favour of a more surreal exit from the situation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I thought it was interesting, though, because I, I did a little bit of research on sperm whales, too. And I found that actually that's pretty common, uh, that young males, young male sperm whales, leave their families in their early teens to roam the open ocean. Ah, so it was technically, it was science as well as a sketch. <laughs> exactly. And they go mostly alone and they never see their families again. Wow. I, I looked into whales a little bit myself and found uh, that the... Uh, the hunting of the whales, because the implication for me of that sketch was that whale was going to get harpooned for sure. Uh, uh, and they used to be hunted, obviously, for the spermacetti, which sounds like a pasta, which does. is apparently in their head. It's a kind of oil that they use for lamps, whale oil that's right. in, in their head. And it's used, no one's quite sure what it's used for, but the dominant theory is that it's part of their echolocation system. Uh, oh, I thought, I thought, well, it's used for light lamps. <laughs> Yeah, they just squeeze a bit out when they need to light a few lamps. No, uh, it's I guess the density affects the sound waves going through and they can, I don't know, change the density and it in some way helps them find what more about the echolocation messages that they're getting. But that's what it's for, this oily, waxy stuff that's in their heads. And the heads are, I discovered, they are 30% head at a sperm whale. <laughs> really? Yeah. Where does the head end and a body well, start? Yeah, it's sort of neck, isn't it? But I guess it must have a point at which the spine starts if you really burrowed into it, but... How weird. Um, right, well, I so from my research, uh, I found out that they are the largest of the toothed whales. They are the longest and deepest divers. They have the planet's largest brain and the longest intestine. Worldwide, uh, sperm whales eat as much squid in a year as all of the biomass which is removed from the ocean by all of the modern human fisheries combined. Wow. So that implies there's... A, a lot more squid in the ocean than I, than I had any idea of. I thought yes. they were kind of a very rare creature. And B, does that mean we should kill all the whales to save the squid? I don't know. Whose side are we on now? Save the squid. <laughs> <laughs> there are over 20 different whale families off Dominica. Ten, apparently, are seen very regularly. Oh, actual specific family groups. Family groups. And a family yeah. group consists of grandmothers, mothers, and their, and their calves. Usually about seven in a family. Well, it's a very matriarchal society, isn't it? I think yeah. with most mammals, actually. Yeah, but apparently the families do hang out. They recognise each other and the, like they can recognise one from like decades later. So they've got a good memory, apparently. And they all have their own slightly different dialect. Um, it's like a Morse code type social call. So apparently in uh, Dominica, they have this what's called a one plus one plus three coda, which sounds like click, 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 click. And apparently that is like <laughs> that is unique to the region. I kind of suspect the Wales is more of a click. click. <laughs> All right. Click. So 
So I was also interested in the colour purple. We the film touched lightly on uh, the flag having the colour purple in being. Oh, two... is it Murex? The colour comes from, it, doesn't it? The Murex snail, exactly. So the uh... hence imperial purple. How so, Paul? Well, the Roman emperors used to wear purple because it was so rare uh, to get the the dye out of the Murex snails that it used to be reserved just for the emperor. Exactly right. So that's why we have this connection of royalty and purple, because it was this hugely expensive dye. You had to use, collect gajillions of snails and mush them up to make any purple, enough purple dye to dye anything of any substance. Uh-huh. Uh, but that's not what I found most interesting. In 1856, there was a chap called Perkin. So Perkin was an 18-year-old chemist and he was trying to synthesise quinine, actually, in his lab. And it wasn't really working out very well. And he ended up with this gunky black syrup in his pot, whatever chemists use. And then he dissolved his gunk in alcohol and it it was a deep purple liquid he got out. And this is became Perkins Purple, also known as Aniline Purple or right. Movine, the first synthetic dye. Nice. Uh, and this actually changed the the journey of purple as a colour because then it's no longer really expensive to make and so what the historic associations now anyone can wear purple now yeah right so um yeah perkins purple changed the game good news for the snails <laughs> <laughs> yeah great news for the snail can you imagine oh those look at snails breathing a huge sigh of relief being smushed into a flag maybe perkin himself was just a thousand snails in a lab coat <laughs> <laughs> Weird idea. <laughs> There's something odd about that Perkin. He leaves a trail wherever he goes. <laughs> so talking of uh, different colours, we were talking about purple there, um, the colour maroon. Yes. Um, is that kind of purple-ish colour? Kind of some reddy brown isn't it? Brown? Or... Yeah, maybe. Okay. Well, look, uh, I was interested in the maroons, uh, and I, I was thinking, well, do they still exist? Like, are there groups of people that consider themselves to be maroon? You know, write it on forms and stuff. Anyway, uh, I looked it up and I found that in Dominica in November 2021, just passed, they held a conference for descendants of Maroons. Uh, The aim of the conference was for... It was to encourage the descendants of those Maroons to sort of speak out, share their stories, um, and by doing so, motivate descendants of Maroons around the Caribbean to do the same. So there are. Uh, In fact, the, the, the... there are 13 countries, I think. Uh, so there are Maroons from Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, Suriname, Belize, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Grenada, Martinique, Guadeloupe, Sierra Leone, and North America. So wow. lots of lots, lots of them. Uh, the person who ran the, uh, the Maroon conference said, now is the time to tell our stories and to empower all those wallowing in self-pity, those who lost their way, the children who feel there is nothing to live for, the children who look to North America and the videos and feel there is no royalty in their existence. Time for them to hold their heads up in pride because we are proud descendants of Maroons. So it's probably worth clarifying that although you linked with the colour, my recollection of last week was that the Maroon came from the word Cimarron, 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 which was like untamed Beast. Beast, that was it. Um, and you said last week that that wasn't the name they called themselves. That's but right. it sounds from what you're saying there that that no longer carries that kind of sense of not being the right word to use for them. No, on all the logos and all of the, the, the promotional material for the conference, it was it was maroon. It seems to be used, yeah. They, they used the name uh, Nyankipong Pickaboo. Uh, which meant children of the almighty. It does sound a little bit like uh, something from a Gilbert and Sullivan operator, yes. doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, isn't that Nanky Poo or something? I believe it is. So... I thought it was a great episode, Ryan. I have to tell you, I enjoyed it. I learned a great deal. And now I want to go to Dominica, or Dominica, sorry. Uh, every time. It's really hard to get out of that, isn't it? <laughs> I don't know why. Um, but yes, I've now added to the list of places I'd really like to go. Uh, but my opinion is a chaff on the wind compared to what we're here for. <laughs> That's <is> not. <laughs> uh, so we've come to the end of our discussions. It's time for you to step into the dock. Yeah. Uh-huh. Prepare to face. Beg your pardon. 
That was, that was the sound of the uh, door. Oh, the I thought opening. you had a squeaky floorboard. I don't know if a dock has a door, actually. I just assumed that you have to kind of open a little door to get in it. A little swing door, like in a cowboy saloon. Yeah, that's what I had in my head. Hmm. So, Judge Dursley, are you ready to give your verdict? Um, yes, I am, I think. Will the defendant, Mr. Ryan Weir, please rise? I have risen. Your Honour, as ever, if we could start proceedings by first asking for your verdict on the factual content of the show. The factual content of the show was rather weak. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. There was maroons and whales and conches and everything. It was sort of some of the stuff you mentioned today was more interesting. Um, C+. Plus. I think that's harsh, but I'm in a record keeper. I have no input here. Uh, so, the second judgment to be passed on entertainment value, including the hilarious sketches. I found it quite entertaining, actually. I don't know. I don't know why. I'll give you a B minus. B minus. <laughs> nice, promising. Ryan, hold it. Say nothing. Shh, shh, shh. Don't don't risk anything. anything. Don't don't upset him. You, you can see I want to say something, right? <laughs> no, I'm helping you out. Here. Okay. And finally, the ever amorphous, unexpected Dursley factor. I think I uh, Ryan. I think you've produced a rather good advert uh, for Dominica slash Dominica. Um, so I think I'll give you a B minus again. Nice. All right. And so we meet the final verdict. So Ryan, before the judge passes the final, the main, the ultimate verdict, you have an opportunity to enter your plea. Would you like to make your plea now? Um, can I have a good grade, please? I was hoping for more All right. substance. <laughs> <laughs> I worked really hard on this one and I really enjoyed doing it. Ah, he's gone for begging. Interesting. Yeah. Your Honour, the defendant stands slash grovels before you. Have you reached a verdict? Um, yes, I have. And so I ask respectfully for your ruling. I actually, I quite liked it. I'll give you a B minus. That's an excellent result, his little face. Ah, uh, yay! Is there anything you'd like to address the court with, sir? Yeah, I want to thank him for the B+. Um, I'm really pleased with it. I, it's it's rare that I get a B+, so I'm going to take the... What? Take you that. didn't get a B+. <laughs> <laughs> I figured I might get away with I it. I think the court recorder may have other, other views than that, Ryan. We don't have a stenographer here, so... Oh, it's not, it is recorded, though, isn't it? It's <laughs> <laughs> kind of the point. Oh, well. Is this the bit where the sound changes totally when I'm giving the, when I'm giving the score and Ryan's voice tries to imitate mine with A minus? <laughs> oh, I kind of want to hear that. But still, here we go. So uh, that was an excellent matter. I enjoyed the episode as ever. I'm a less harsh ruler than Mr. Dursley. Uh, but I always have a good time. Even though you got to eat frog's legs and or faux frog's legs, and you also got to eat bugs. I loved it. I oh, didn't okay. love the bugs, to, to be honest with you, but the bugs were fine. They were okay. The chicken and frog's legs were delicious. So a shout out to Naomi. Naomi for, once again, feeding me lovely things. So were they, they, were, they didn't come from someone's to Tom's talking reptiles, did you? They weren't talking them. <laughs> no, but Tom, if you've got any leftovers, let us know for the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> okay that's the show for this week coming up we have the country of latvia the time period of 2005 to 2010 nice and modern and the topic of come hell or high water that's the bit i'm interested in I'm fascinated to see where that goes. You're going to be fascinated, sir. Yeah. Whether you like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> but as regards today, that is our show for this week. So thank you, everyone, for listening. If you'd like to get in touch about anything we've talked about on this show or just to say hi, you can reach out on social media through the website at hhepodcast.com or email us at Pete and Ryan at hhepodcast.com. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you. And you never know, if you get in touch, you might end up featured on a future show. And that would definitely happen if you rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. So your recommendation there can really help bring the show to new listeners like yourself. That's right. And if you're on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter, any of the socials, uh, you can find us at HHE Podcast. And if you subscribe, you're going to get an alert every time we post one of our one-minute animated bites. And Arnie says we'll be back uh, with the next episode soon. But in the meantime, a huge thank you to the judge himself. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much for having me. And that's it. I guess all that's left to say is... You've been listening to...
I actually like frog's legs, but it's one of those things that you're sort of put off by the way it's presented. You sort of like get a pair of legs with a truncated spinal column sticking up at you. It's a bit off-putting. I've never had frog's legs, and that's interesting fact. I did not know that's how they come. I just assumed they came like chicken wings. Well, the, the couple of times I've had them, they were sort of attached. Oh, crumbs. So there was, I, I assumed mm. there was a bit of an anus there as well. That I could you do without could pelvis suckle. in my uh, in my dinner. Oh, dear. But you, you then picked the meat off like, as if they were chicken legs. But you enjoyed it, though? Yes. It... Did it taste like chicken? Yeah. Uh, (laughs) nice very good